Good evening, everyone. Welcome along to the SFC interviews here with Craig Reed today. This is for number 40 as well. So uh, how are you doing, Craig? How's things been, obviously, through lockdown and, and COVID and everything like that for you? Yeah, I think like everybody else, it's been a very strange and, and difficult time. Um, you know, it's uh, something obviously we've never been used to. So it's been, you know, something we, we've had to sort of get used to. Um, my partner's a nurse, so she's sort of been in, in the thick of it, really. So, uh, yeah, we're just trying to trying to get through it like everyone else, I think. And, of course, uh, you know, you mentioned there in regards to your partner as well. So, you know, what's it like for her? Obviously, it's going to be difficult for her working all these hours and, and everything as well. Yeah, yeah, she, she's been in the thick of it right from the start. So, um, you know, she's... I think she's seen everything there is to see, um, you know, within the hospital and and what everything that's gone on, um, you know. And I think obviously everybody's starting to appreciate what a hard job they have, you know, and they they just battle through it. Um, but no, she's considering everything she's gone through. She's she's coped really well. It's like my next door neighbour as well. My next door neighbour is very much the same. They're. Uh... They just moved in actually not too long ago, and they're nurses and stuff as well. So they're they're never there. Right? I barely ever see them. Yeah, so. she's the same. Yeah, she's the same. But yeah, let's let's talk football anyway. So uh, going back to 2011, 2012, when you signed up with Steenage in the first place, there. Uh, what were your sort of main reasons behind coming across to Borough? And you know, you were signed for quite a big fee as well. So did you sort of feel that that was any added pressure on yourself? I didn't feel it was added pressure. Um, because at the time there was a there was a few different clubs that had, had made bids, at, but I think once I spoke to Graham Wesley, um, we actually spoke on the phone. It was uh, the last day of the transfer window. Um, and I'm sure, as as everybody knows, with Graham, he, he sets a plan, and you know he'll he'll make it happen one way or another. And I just like the way that he went about things and uh, the way he he sold the club to me and obviously I knew myself that the, the club had been successful coming up the, uh, the leagues. So it was just something I thought I'd like to be a part of. And, you know, it, it was a great decision in the end. And of course, you know, were you aware of the club as well? Obviously getting promoted from the conference, you know, how often have you played against the club before signing? Yeah, I would played uh, against uh, the club during that pre-season. So I actually played for Newport against Stevenage, uh, at Spitty Park in in Newport, and I actually scored right. against Stevenage. So I think that was sort of where um, Graham and Dino first sort of seen me. Uh, yeah. Obviously playing against the team that had just got promoted. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I did, and obviously I knew of Stevenage anyway. Fair enough. Um, we've got a message here from Russ. Um, well, we'll get into that. I was going to go into that a little bit later anyway, but we'll jump straight into that now. Would you ever sort of go into coaching or punditry or, or management um, after you've finished playing? Have you finished playing at the moment? Are you still playing? Or No, no I have now. Uh, yeah, I finished, I finished playing um, just over two years ago. Um, but with, with regards to the coaching, I, I, I did go into my coaching and, and I... I received my UEFA B badge. Um, to get to the next level of UEFA A is very difficult. You have to be working within um, the academies, essentially, right. to get because they only have a very limited amount of space on the okay. court. Room. Yeah. So you have to be working within the clubs to get them slots, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it be, it, you know, I think as you'll see with a lot of footballers, it's quite difficult to get into clubs because whilst you've been playing the game, you know, since the age of, you know, professionally since the age of 16, like myself, mm -hmm. whilst you've actually been playing the game, there's coaches that haven't played the game, but have been able to get their badges and then have the jobs within football clubs. And they're yeah, sort of yeah. in there before you're, you can get in. Yeah, yeah. It can be quite difficult for, for ex-players to, to get in. You'd think it'd be easy, but it, it's really not. It's a bit like my mate, actually. My mate, um, he started off with a little sort of seven-a-side sort of team um, and then he's moved that on to an 11-a-side team. And 
you know, he had had no experience playing football or, you know, nothing mm. like that. Um, he just decided to create this club off the, you know, off his back and, yeah, sort of run it as a seven aside, then the 11 aside club. And uh, he's going to be bringing it back next year. So, you know. Yeah, I think the thing is, this is probably where there's a fault in the in the system really because there's so many players with so much experience because they've been the the children in the academies they've been the young teenagers they've been the young professionals and obviously then they've been the senior professionals and they've yeah. been there and done it and there's a lot of players that just cannot get into football clubs even though they have a wealth of experience they've played hundreds of professional games all because on paper they don't have the qualifications that the FA say you should have, but yet there'll be people that have never played a professional game in their life that have had all the time in the world to then get their qualifications and get them jobs. So I think there's there's something there that, that needs to be done really because there's a lot of good players and, and ex-players that are missing out, passing on what they know to to young players because they just can't get in. And he had an opportunity with Cheltenham, uh, not Cheltenham, sorry, Chelmsford as well. Um, and he was working with uh, Chris Welpdale at Chelmsford. And, you know, Chris is one of the few that has actually got into coaching. Mm. Yeah, you know, it, it's very difficult. What can I say? There, there'll be a, a lot of players, probably a lot of lads that were in my team at Stevenage, you know, probably in a similar position. I've got a wealth of experience, but trying to obtain the qualifications you need to then get into coaching is very very difficult um you know and it was something that I explored but I just found it it got to the point where it was becoming a roadblock you couldn't get any further really and then yeah so we've got a question here from Jordan as well uh who was your best friend at Stevenage and it kind of ties in with another question I was going to ask you as well because when you signed obviously that squad was very settled there Mm-hmm. Um, so how important was it for you to, you know, get that bond with your strike partners as well? Obviously, um, Byron Harrison was there, Beardo was there. Yeah, yeah you know, it was a, it was a very tight knit group because I think you know a lot of them had all played together for a long time. Um, but I think just the way I am, you know, I'm a very easygoing lad, and you know, I, I always like to work hard in training and you know in games. So I think I sort of fitted in with the lads pretty much straight away um but there was a number of like i couldn't pick one in particular because there was just there was a a number of them that just got on so well you know the likes of ronnie henry uh scott laird darius charles you know just to name a few laurie wilson um just lads are, we all got on as a group and i think that's why we were successful you know we didn't mind handing out um a bit of a talent off when needed, you know, but then on the other side, there was a, there was a good side. There was a, a good laugh as well. And then, you know, you mentioned there in regards to Ronnie Henry, um, yeah. obviously Ronnie Henry's gone on and he's, he's achieved so much for the club. Um, and, you yeah. know, your captain at the time was, was Robbo as well. So what was Robbo like as a leader? Again, very committed, you know, you, you have players like that, that, you know, I think Stevenage as a, as a group, GW wouldn't have had somebody that didn't fit in with the group. Um, you know, Robbo was very committed, you know, wanted to win all the time, whether it was training, whether it was games, you know, no matter what it was. And that sort of rubbed off on the rest of us as well. And it sort of brought the best out of everybody else. Uh, John Ashton was the same, you know. It, it wasn't one particular player. It was sort of just in everybody. And, you know, anybody that did come in that was new soon found out that they had to meet that standard as well. If they didn't, GW wouldn't play them. And, you know, they wouldn't get the results that they wanted. And you were, were part of that team. Obviously, uh, Robbo went on to, to manage as well. He was he was caretaker manager for a while. You were un, under uh, his, own, his uh, leadership as a manager, weren't you, as well? Yeah, you know, it was a bit of a strange way that it come about, but um, obviously the chairman trusted him at the time to to do that. You know, not if I remember right, not not too much change. You know, we still trained the same way, we still went about things the same way, which was good. Yeah. You know, it, it didn't it didn't unsettle us too much. Um, but yeah, just 
proof that you know that the, the chairman did trust him to do that. And of course, that came about when Graham uh, up and, and left and went to Preston. So you know that was uh, a bit of upheaval for for Graham and, and for mm. Dino and a lot of the players as well. Um, and that kind of unsettled all of the squad, didn't it, as well at, the, at that time? Um, yeah. Do you, do you feel that you know we could have gone on and, and achieved maybe a second promotion there if uh, Graham had stuck around? A hundred percent. Um, you know, I remember when when Graham left, I I was just coming out at the other end of having a hernia injury, um, and a, you know, you can't stop somebody from going on and progressing. Obviously, Preston were a huge club, and you know they they had a huge budget, and they were wanting to go on and do, you know, the the next thing and get promoted themselves. Yeah. Um, but there's been plenty of times when I when I look back on on that part of the season, and I think if GW did stay, I think we definitely would have got promoted. Um, you know, just because of the way that he he was with the players, the way we trained, the way we uh, behaved, everything. Not that it changed massively, but I just think because we were such a tight knit group for a big cog. To, to leave then yeah I think it did have a big impact and of course Gary Smith came in as well um, you know a, a lot of fans don't actually know him in, re- in regards to Gary Smith that he actually had quite a big impact as well um, I spoke to, to Robbo I've spoken to some of the other guys that were part of that squad as well Laurie as well um, and they, you know they've all said that Gary Smith you know w- without Gary Smith that club might not have even got prom- um, to the playoffs at all come the end of that season you know he mm. was able to get everyone together again on on the back of Graham leaving and, and just kind of you know setting his aim straight and yeah just, just going again. Yeah, I think I think Gary was always going to be up against it because of the success that the club had had previously and the trajectory that the club was on. You know, he he had to come in and sort of try and replicate what had been done before, and I think. You know, from a fan's point of view, they probably expected it as well because we were doing so well and we were definitely punching above our weight, which we sort of liked, really. We were always that underdog, which is, you know, uh, everybody loves an underdog, don't they? Yeah, so, oh, for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good way uh, of being. Um, but I just think, obviously, Gary Smith did come in and he did change a few things around and... Uh, who knows if if it had stayed the same, would we have got promoted? We we don't know. But and then we'll go. We'll, we'll take it back a little bit to when you first signed uh, for the club. Uh, you were signed, you know, in that January transfer window there. Um, mm. So you know, was it hard to come into an already settled group of players there? And uh, you know, what was it about Graham as well? You know, what did Graham say to you upon signing? Um, I think. It, I don't think it was hard to to come and join the team. Obviously, I think it was very apparent as soon as I walked in the door um, that the the standards were very high, which yeah. is a good thing. Um, Graham was the first to to bat anybody down. You know, if they if you thought they were getting a bit too big for their boots or or whatever else. Um, luckily, I, I I didn't get on the receiving end of, of them, but. I was made very aware from the start that there's a certain way to behave, certain way to train, you know, certain way to to be in and around the place. Yeah, and it didn't, and it doesn't take long for you to adapt to it and to become, you know, that sort of player. And Laurie actually said it when I spoke to him, and I was listening back to Laurie's. I think it was last night or the night before. You know, it was kind of very easy to actually um, train, and you know, you weren't really that that sort of um, bothered about the whole train, training side of it and the hours because the winning was coming every week. Yeah, you know, it, it, I don't think it was, you know, any secret, the the amount of hours that we put in training. Yeah. You know, there was a number of times we'd be um, at the stadium on, you know, a Thursday evening, still mm-hmm. training, getting ready for Saturday, you know, playing 11 aside games. You know, it was, and it did get to the point where it's just normal, you know, yeah. going in, doing 
three or four hours worth of training and then you're in the gym for a couple of hours after you know it was unheard of at other football clubs but it's what we did um and yeah you just it just become normal and and probably like laurie said you know we would work that hard but we knew that because we were working that hard we could outwork the other teams yeah you know on paper the the other teams might have had supposedly better players but they wouldn't have been able to outwork us that's right and you know that that showed in not just the league but in the cup campaigns as well mm. uh, even the the season that you signed you know we just beaten newcastle about a month before that and then in the the season you were there of course was the spurs game getting the replay yeah. and, and then going to white hot lane so what was it like you know playing up against the likes of defoe and gareth bale and added by or etc you know it's a it's a career highlight um i the the Spurs game at home was my first game back from my hernia. Right. Um, and then obviously I played at White Hart Lane. And like you say, how many people can say that they've done that, you know, uh, against that team that was flying at the time? Gareth Bale was flying at the time just before he went to Real Madrid. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's not many people that can say outside of the obviously the top league. That they've done that and it took them to a replay and what actually went one nil up that's it yeah you know there's not many and it's one of them things that i'll always be able to tell my children you know we've still got the dvd of it and you know i've still got defoe's shirt um yeah it was a, it was a great experience and we were well in that game as well you know even yeah. after going to two one down <laughs> i think robo had that chance we hit the crossbar and yeah, we had a couple of other chances as well. Where you know, on another day, we might have even you know taken them to extra time, for example. And you know, how great would that have been? Yeah, and you know, stranger things have happened, haven't they? And you know, I have since watched the the game back yeah. and some of the highlights. Yeah, yeah. Right, we did have a couple of chances. That one that Robbo hit the um, the crossbar with it bounced just behind Cudicini, and I threw, yeah. threw myself at it. But Gareth Bale just managed to clear it. And you just think if that was just another inch, you know, we could have got that in. And I had another one that Cudicini saved. And you just think, yeah, if, if they would have if there was a, a worse goalkeeper in, yeah, you know, yeah. we we probably could have drew that game or took them to extra time, you know. And Matt said it there, even the home game, we could have won the home game as well. I think Jozo had a shot. Mm. Um that Cudicini tips over the bar and there's a couple of other chances in the home game as well. Yeah, I think Don uh, Cowan was, was using his pace to run at them and stuff as well. Yeah, that's it. You, it it's not anything that hasn't happened in the past, is it? A, a smaller club upset in one of the big clubs. So we were we were well in the mix to do that, definitely. Um, so let's jump to the next one here. Message from Tom. Uh, tell Craig I said hello. He's a, a South End fan. Uh, you had a spell with them as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I had a had a brief spell before coming back to Stevenage, the um, the second time. Um, so yeah, that that sort of come about when I got sold from Stevenage to Aldershot. You know, I I personally had a good season, but obviously the club went into financial difficulties, and mm. um, I was the only asset really that they could sell. So uh, that's how it ended up that I ended up going to South End. That's it. Matt said it there. Don Cowan missed the sitter at the end of the home game. That's it. I remember that as well. Yeah. He could have uh, he could have probably scored that. I think if, if I was to get hit one, he'd probably uh, say that yeah, one Don, of the regrets Don, probably. Yeah. Don was one of them players that was just so fast. So mm. and I think deceptively fast as well. You that's know, right. I, think, I remember uh, um Don Song was uh I think his song was like, you'll never run faster than Don Cowan or something. So, <laughs> uh, You know, there were plenty of times in training, like say we'd have 11 a side game and mm. a ball would be going through to Daisy and you'd think, oh, you know, he's just going to come out and collect it and Don would come out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, um, he probably is one of the quickest players that I've, that I've come across, I think. And then we've got a message here as well. Um what would your advice be to players who are trying to move forward in their career but keep facing disappointments or sort of challenges? 
I suppose you can't give up, really. You know, I don't think there would be a footballer out there that has not come across some sort of disappointment yeah. at some time. Um, depending on what it is, you know, if it's something within yourself, if a, if a club is telling you you need to work on this, work on that, you know, then they're obviously identifying um, what you need to do and, and that's down to you to, to get better at that. But if it's somewhere where you're just not happy, it's worth being somewhere happy because the true footballer will come out. And when, you, when you're somewhere happy and you're full of confidence, you're a different kind of player. That's a great answer as well. And then we've got another message there from Giggsy again. Uh, what would you say your proudest moment in your career was? Um, I would have to I would have to say obviously our promotion um, at Old Trafford. Yeah. Um, you know we worked so hard to get there, and we were up against it from the January when I signed to the very last day you know, of of that season to get into the playoffs and then obviously go through the playoffs, which was tough, obviously, against Accrington, who were never easy team yeah. to play against. Mm-hmm. We sort of, we went about it the tough way, but that's what we did. You know, we, we'd rather go the tough way, if that makes sense, if sort of in our character to be that way. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably, I would, I would say that the promotion. And you said about Accrington there as well. That was actually your debut for the club was against Accrington. Um, yeah. so do you remember much about that? And sort of when were you aware that you were going to be in the squad? I don't remember a huge amount, if I'm honest, um, because it, it all very it all happened very well. And I think you know GW eased me sort of into it. Um, but yeah, Accrington were always one of the, and I think they still are now. You know, they're one of them teams that punch above their weight, but they're yeah. always the tough team to play against, always a tough team to play against away from home. You know, they, they're a bit similar to Stevenage in a way. You know, they, mm. they don't mind a fight and a battle. And we, like I say, when we were going through the, the promotion side, we we come up against them and they were a difficult team, but we just were able to, to outdo them. That's right. And then uh, we've got a message here from Nathan saying, what a player. Uh, and then we've got one from Matt as well. That Atkinson pitch for the second leg of the playoffs was a joke. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it was. Yeah. We, had, and, uh, we, had, we had control of the game, though, from the home leg. Obviously, we were, what was it? Was it 2-0 two, two or 3-1 or something up? No, we were a couple of goals up, weren't we? Yeah, we were a couple of goals up, but then we had to go there and you quite rightly say about the pitch. The pitch was terrible. Um, and they were obviously made to to try and rough us up because I remember Phil Edwards, who we ended up signing. That's it, yeah, yeah. Um, elbowing me off the ball, and he actually he cut my head, which uh, I still got the the scar from during. It was it was just above my eye, mm-hmm. um, and it you know it, it was dirty little tactics like that that was all set to try and upset you know the apple cart and. And try and put us off, but um, you know it obviously didn't work. But we uh, we obviously went on to win it. That's right. And then of course you mentioned there about the um, the, the Torquay game as well. So you know what was that like to to go and, and step you know step foot on Old Trafford and you know of course winning it at the end as well with with Moose's goal and the the way that we went up. Yeah, it was a bit of a surreal moment because, uh, you know, all through my career, the one place I always wanted to play was Old Trafford, um, whether it be against Man United or, or anybody else. Yeah. So for it to happen the way it did, um, and, you know, it obviously started a few weeks before that because I had to score the penalty against Berry. That's, very, that's right, yeah, the free free. Yeah. yeah, for us to get that point to go into the playoffs. So there was a lot mm-hmm. of pressure on there. Yeah. Um and then I remember the whole build up. We we just trained like it was any other week. You know, there wasn't any easing off. We were still in the gym for a couple of hours a day. You know, we were still doing the long runs that GW made us do. You know, we didn't really change too much. Yeah. You know, a lot of the a lot of the things that he did go into detail was um which I thought was really good, was he got the measurements of the the Man United pitch. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he, and he actually had that marked out on our training pitch because obviously it was a lot bigger pitch than we were normal 
you know, mm -hmm. that we were used to playing on. So we got used to the dimensions of the game before actually stepping onto the pitch. So when we got on it, we didn't actually think, oh, wow, this is a huge pitch. No, because you've been yeah. playing, yeah. 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 We were, we're probably yeah. a week beforehand, we were training on a pitch that was the same size. Um, that's brilliant. Like, obviously, Graham yeah. was known for some strange methods, but that's genius. That's, and, and you know, that's it. I, He'll always be known for obviously the the things that have probably gone wrong. Yeah, but there's a lot of stuff that he did that was steps ahead. Uh -huh. You know, he didn't he didn't miss a trick and stuff like that. You just think maybe that was that one percent. You know that you you gained on Torquay because Torquay had probably been training on a smaller pitch. Mm -hmm. Had they had they been doing their fitness work on a bigger pitch, probably not like we had. So yeah, things like that. I, I I think he deserves a lot of uh, a lot of respect for. And of course, last season he came back as well um, for a, a short stint. Uh, were you surprised mm -hmm. to see him come back? And obviously, Dino, his assistant at the time, was manager as well um, at the start of that season and the season before as well. Um, not really. Um, I think at the time the club needed to win games. And he has a certain way about him to win games, whether they're winning them ugly or or, or winning them well. Yeah. Um, and I think the club just needed to try and win games, however they come about. So I can see the method in in bringing him back as to why. And obviously, he knows the club. He knows the club very well. The club know him very well, and Dino. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't think it was a surprise. Obviously, he's been back a few times now. That was probably more of a surprise, but. Um, I could see why they did it. And Matt's put a question in here. What made you come back to Stevenage when you re-signed in uh, 2014? Again, it was a it was a conversation with with Graham. Um, you know, I I'd had my time at, at South End, um, and things were changing there, and I just wanted to get back playing football and and enjoying it again. Um, and the opportunity come to come back to Stevenage arose um, and sort of jumped at the chance because obviously my affiliation with the club, um, you know, I, I probably didn't play as much as I'd have wanted to play, but just being back in and around it was, was a good thing. And, you know, you, you said about it earlier on in regards to um, some of the teams that we beat, you know, in your first spell at the club, we beat the likes of Bournemouth and, you know, uh, Sheffield Wednesday, you know, convincingly as well. Uh, Bournemouth convincingly away from home and Sheffield Wednesday at home 5-1. And uh, yeah. they're, they're both games that you scored in yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, they were um, they were both big games for us. Uh, and it was obviously nice to, to score in both of them as well. Um, you know, I remember in particular the, the Sheffield game because... We were we were certainly the underdogs underdogs at our own home. Yeah, but I just remember everything we did just came off that night. We just couldn't put a foot wrong, and we overran them. We scored great goals as well. You know, they weren't scruffy goals. Even I remember my goal was something that we worked on in training. Was okay. a free kick. Was a free mm -hmm. kick that uh, Bozzy had, and it was known that the goalkeeper parries. Their, their free kicks so it was my job to pick up any rebounds and obviously I can remember talking to Bozzy just before that free kick and saying just just get it on target even if you don't score just get it on target and you'll follow it in yeah yeah and follow it in which is what yeah, happened yeah. and then mm -hmm. we scored and then that sort of set you know it got everyone's confidence up and then it sort of set us on the momentum then and then we just took over them and were you in the team that beat Sheffield United as well, 4-0, with uh, the Danny Lopez hat-trick? Were you in that team? Uh, I wasn't, no. I don't, I, th I don't think I was there then. No, because Matt's just put that there. Um, yeah. the, the Rochdale one you were in, weren't you, when you scored in that one as well, the 4-2 against Rochdale at home? Yeah, scored two in that game, yeah. That was, yeah. Uh, what was that like for you, obviously, you know, getting a, getting a brace as well? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's crucial, really, that the two goals that, that won us the game, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And uh, I think Rochdale were doing really well at the time. Um, and it, it was, again, it was just a, a proof of what we could do. You know, a, a supposed 
bigger club, a bit more of an established club in that league, yeah. um, coming to our place and us, us doing them over, you know, I think it's sort of, again, it made people go, oh, you know, who are these guys? Mm-hmm. And we, we seem to do that quite regular, I think. Um, and of course, you know, we, we spoke about Graham before as well. Um, did you ever have to go down for the drinks break at all, personally, or was it just left to other people? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think I was called upon a few times, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I was called upon. <laughs> then this one here, um, the one I remember was Reedy's goal at Oxford. Yeah, that was your first goal for the club. Yeah. And you were yeah. brought on, I think it was about the 88th, 89th minute, if I remember rightly, and uh, went on and, and grabbed the winner in, in injury time. So, you know, what was the conversation like with Graham when, when you were yeah, ready? How that worked, uh, I, I started that game. How it how it uh, worked was um, we obviously playing at the Kazam Stadium. Yeah. And, and during the first half, I, I'd had a couple of chances, well, a couple of half chances where I you know, I got a few shots away and I remember going in at half time and uh, GW saying, you're going to score. Mm-hmm. Like, enough, you're going to score, it's coming. Yeah. But I keep doing what I was doing. Um, and anyway, I got moved, I got moved to the right hand side of a front three. Okay. And, yeah. And I remember um, Sinks getting, just picking the ball up in the centre of midfield and I just made that run across the back four where nobody followed me and he was able to to slip me in. And yeah, then the rest was, you know, history. I remember left foot bending it around the keeper and it was a special moment because it had been coming for a while, the first goal, yeah. and it was always nice to to get off the mark. And it took you um, a little while to, to get your first goal as well, didn't it? That took you, I'm not quite sure how many games it was, but it was a, a fair amount of games before you actually managed to get your first mm. goal as well, wasn't it? So, you know, I'm sure you yeah. would have wanted to get that first goal a lot sooner than you were able to. Yeah, it yeah, it took me a little little while, but I think the difference is I'd come from a, a football club, obviously at Newport, where I was the out and out centre forward, you yeah. know, and my all I was, you know, focused about was just scoring goals. When I come to Stevenage, you know, it was it was made very aware from the start that you're not just here to try and score goals as a, a bigger picture, you know, and mm-hmm. that's why like my I think GW trusted me in different positions, you know, to either play on the left, play on the right, as a number ten, as a number nine, you know, me and Darius up front, me and Byron yeah, up yeah. front. My, uh-huh. You know, I I think I played pretty much all of the positions at some point in the midfield and sent forward positions. Um whereas when I was at Newport I was a number nine. You know, I didn't I didn't move out of the width of the eighteen yard box. I was I was never really the sort that would be tracking, you know, left and right wingers back. But you know, my role at Stevenage was different and that's and that's probably why it did take me a little bit longer to get off the mark and probably score as many goals as I wanted to, because you you always had other jobs to do as well. And then uh, Matt there, that was the one about Oxford, uh, which was the winning goal as well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laura there did Craig play alongside Alex Ravel or, or know much about Alex Ravel and you know what do you think about him as a manager and how do you think he'll get on I I didn't play with him um, obviously he's he's taken over now at, yeah. at Stevenage and you know I think like any any young coach any young manager as I was saying before they need an opportunity you need an in you need to be given a chance to show what you can do. And obviously the, the chairman's thought he's good enough to do that, which is, you know, credit to him because it is certainly not easy. Um, I think with the club that he's at there, he'll get that opportunity to prove his worth. And it's pro- been proven as well with GW that you do do well. You will get an opportunity to move on, you know. It, go on, yeah. And I'm sure that's probably you know, what he'll want to do at some point in his managerial career, you know, he'll want to prove himself at this level. And then if, a, you know, a big club does come in, he'll, he'll want to prove himself there as well. And how important is it for Alex to have the likes of Lenny Lawrence there, you know, somebody that's been there and done it all? Yeah, well, Lenny Lawrence was at Newport when I was at Newport as well. And he helped, um, you know, Michael Flynn a lot. Um 
you know, it, it obviously makes a difference having somebody that's been there and done it for so many years and a bit of um, a bit of advice on how to do things. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, he's going to be his own man. You know, he's going to pick his team. He's going to do the tactics that he wants to do. He, you know, he's not going to be dictated to by somebody else. It's just obviously there to get advice and bounce ideas off, you know. So um, I think it's it's only a good thing having somebody else, you know, to, to help you along. And that's quite a good backroom team as well. You know, if you look at it, we've got Lenny Lawrence in there, Mark Sampson, who's got experience as well. And even mm. uh, Ash is there doing some uh, fitness coach stuff with, with the team as well. So obviously Ash is a winner and he's, you know, gone up through the leagues with the club as well. Yeah, and, and like that, having Ash there, Ash will know what, you know, the standards of Stevenage are, you know, because he was he was one of the players like I was in, in that time uh, during the successful years. So he'll know exactly what, you know, to, to demand off, off the current players. Um, again, that's another good thing. He, you know, he might not be the... Um, first team coach or something like that but he will be I'm sure somebody that the manager does revert back to and say well what do you think you know you've been here you've done it and that's that's exactly my point I was saying earlier you've got people that haven't played games that are in good positions and then you've got players like Ash who have been there and done it and aren't in you know the the, probably the coaching or managerial positions they should be um so I think it's a good thing that the manager's got somebody like him there that he can bounce ideas off because Ash has been there and done it himself. Absolutely, yeah. And then uh, we've got another message from Matt, which I'll, I'll jump to actually before I go to mine. Uh, so who was the best player that you played with? And, you know, that, that Stevenage side, of course, was, uh, you know, full, like full of them, wasn't it? There was Moose, there was Bozzy, there was Robbo, Ronnie, Daisy, Lairdy, Ash. Mm. So many, so many. Yeah, yeah. Uh... You know, I think from the from the Stevenage team, this is obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it'd be hard to 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 single out, you know, somebody in particular. But I think somebody that was just always consistent is Ronnie Henry. You know, he obviously by his statistics, how many games he's played. You know, yeah. the Stevenage, um, they speak for themselves, and he's played you know, all through the leagues as well, which isn't an easy thing to do and remain at one club for such a long time. You know, I think that that's credit to Ronnie because, um, you know, it'd be very easy for a club to get promoted and then look to bring in other players. But he's obviously been there the whole, well, or was there the whole time. Um, I think he was just Mr. Consistent. You know, he was great in the dressing room as well. You know, that that's another thing. That's important. It's, it's good people off the pitch as well. And, you know, you said it there um, about, about Ronnie. Um, you know, who else is there that, that can go to Luton, win promotion with Luton and, and come back to Stevenage and still be loved as much as Ronnie is? Exactly. But I think it's um, a credit to Ronnie's character as well. You know, he's a, he's a very funny lad, very likeable lad. Um, you know, I think it'd be the sort that it doesn't matter if you'd seen him yesterday or five years ago, he'd still yeah. be the same, you know. So, um, it is. It, he's just one of them infectious characters, I think. And uh, of course, he had his testimonial as well. Um, you were you invited down to the testimonial? I don't remember if you played in it or not. No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I was. Uh, I was working at time, so I was actually going to come down to right. it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's a credit to him, you know, everything he's done, you know, for the club, rightly so. He he should be rewarded for it, you know. He's been there through the tough times as well and through the good times, so yeah, he certainly deserved it. And then uh, what else have we got on here? So yeah, we, we spoke about the Berry game a little a little while ago, the one that got us into the playoffs as well. Um, mm. Even the, the League One season, we spoke about that one, about the games against Bournemouth and, and things like that. Um, so in regards to that FA Cup campaign that took us to White Hart Lane, was it a, you know, a little bit more special for you in the fact that the club had done it the season previously without you when you, you weren't there and obviously hadn't signed in time and stuff as well? 
Um, I don't think it was even more special just because I was there. I think it was just because the way that it come about, you know, um, we held such a good account of ourselves at home. Yeah. Um, you know, we were obviously rewarded with a big game. You know, I think financially, obviously, it helped the club as well. But at the end of the day, it's about the memories. You know, as I said to you earlier, how many people can say we they've done what we did? Um, mm -hmm. you know and played against the players that we played against on that night um so it was it was just a it was a huge thing huge thing for the club and obviously a, a memory people keep forever and i think you know in regards to you signing for the club as well i think a lot of that transfer uh, money would have been from the games against newcastle and stuff as well wouldn't it mm. yeah i'm sure i'm sure the um the money did help towards the fee that was paid, um, you know, and I think the promotion as well helped because yeah. um, I think there was a fee if we got promoted as well. I think there was a fee that was that was due as well. Right. Um, but yeah, it's um, it was just success. It, sometimes, obviously, the the stars just align. They they won that game, gave them a bit more money. They were able to add to the squad, not just myself, but others as well. And yeah. then obviously. It, it helped us in the long run. That's right. And then uh, in regards to uh, when you left the club, uh, you know, that, that first time around, um, what, what was that like for you? Obviously moving on and when you, when you re-signed again um, back mm. in 2014 and, and Graham was back in charge, oh. always in your mind that you had a little bit of unfinished business maybe? I would say so because the, the first time around, um, if I'm honest, I didn't. I didn't want to leave. Um, right. Yeah. You know, we were doing so well, and we had a good end, obviously, to the season. Unfortunately, not getting promoted, but <laughs> it was, you know, for us as a club, it was just proof of what we could do, and then what we could have done the following year. Yeah. Um, but I think the club had, you know, a few different bids that, that have come in for me from, from various clubs and they chose to accept one of them. Um, so, yeah, it, it sort of almost felt like obviously GW had gone and Gary Smith was in there. Maybe Gary wanted to do things a little bit differently to what GW wanted. Um, so I just thought at the time, well, I'd, I'd maybe serve my purpose at, at Stevenage. You know, I'd done the successful bit and getting promoted with them. Yeah. How can get, you know, uh, into the playoffs again? If I was going to leave, I'd rather leave on a high. Yeah, than, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, so if the truth be told, like I said, I wouldn't have wanted to leave, but it was sort of out of my hands. Okay. Um, and then uh, there isn't too much more to get through now. Um, so, of course, the, the second time as well was only a fairly short spell at the club. Uh, you know, why would you say it didn't work out for you that time around as well? Was there anything in that or was it just a matter of you only came in for a short period of time anyway? Yeah, I think it was just, you know, I, I came in maybe to to try and... I sort of, I sort of knew I wasn't going to play all the time. Yeah, I was there. As much as I'd have wanted to, I, I knew I wasn't going to play all the time. and. Um, uh, I think Graham had probably brought somebody like myself back to try and bring a little bit of the standard of the old team back, you know, the, you know, how to be, how to train, you know, and, and so forth. Um, but I think it was just, it was a bit of an uphill battle for him and the club at that time. I think maybe it was just a little bit too much to, to try and get out of. All right. Um, and then, uh, so we, we spoke about uh, Robbo as well. Um, and of course, Michael Falasitas was uh, part of the, one of those squads as well. Mm. I'm not too sure what squad it was, in fact, uh, without delving into the, the libraries and, and looking and stuff. But, you know, how important is it for, for mental health in football and upon coming out of football as well? Honestly, it's absolutely huge. Um, you know, you, you just have to look on Sky Sports Every day, you know, there's somebody talking about it or on the, the BBC app. There's somebody bringing awareness to it. And, you know, 
know, somebody that you would never have thought of. Um, just for instance, I had a look the other day and a lad I played with called Scott Shearer um, is, is on the BBC website saying about, you know, the troubles he suffered with. And, and he's probably one of the most outgoing people you and lively people you'd ever meet. And, yeah. you know, it, it's absolutely huge. And I don't think people realise how much it impacts players because football so temperamental. One day you're the best thing in the world, the next thing the club wants you to move on because they want to earn a bit of money from you or they want to free up wages or something like that. It can really it can really mess with you and you know and, and your home life as well. Um and and what people have got to realise as well is how hard it is. I know everybody thinks how hard it is to become a footballer, but mm. it, it's extremely hard. You know, it starts when you're six or seven years old. It doesn't start at 16 or 18 like most other jobs. Yeah. You know, it starts when you're really young and there's a lot of sacrifices you and your family have to make to get there. Um, and sometimes when you're you're in there, you you realise it's not, it's not everything you think it's going to be as a kid. So a lot of it's obviously away from the pitch. Um, so I think it's absolutely huge that people get the support that they need because there's obviously just so much they have to take into consideration. It affects exactly. everybody. Yeah, I was just going to say, especially with uh, Fallow there as well, you know, mm. he had a lot of injuries to deal with and then he came out of the game, went down a, a different career path and obviously still was in the limelight and things like that. But obviously it was just too too much for him, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and, you know, the, the sad thing is, is, you know, they, they, they try and raise awareness of it. Um, but unfortunately, he probably won't be the last one either that's the sad thing yeah you know there, there will be others as well and there probably have been others since since him that you know things like that have happened and it, and it is so sad because again with with Thala you he was a even though he was a young lad at the time when when we were there he was bubbly he was loud you know confident young lad um, and then obviously you could see as he got older he was he was the same you know, mm-hmm. you thought he, he wouldn't have a care in the world. Big, strapping, good-looking lad, you know, on the TV. Yeah. It, it just shows that it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. It will affect anybody. Absolutely. And, of course, um, the fact it was mental health awareness, was it the weekend as well? It's mm-hmm. a, a great time to, to get it out there and to get it recognised again as well now. Yeah, well, I think it, I, I think it it will be like this forever more now. You know, I don't think it will just be a, a weekend thing or, yeah. you know, or every so often. I think it's something that's just going to keep raising its head up, you know, because there's so many players, you know, and ex-players as well that have suffered with it and they're not scared to come out and talk about it now, whereas they probably were beforehand. Absolutely. It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a part of life as well. It's, something that I deal with myself on a, on a day-to-day basis. And, mm. you know, it can be a, it can be a struggle sometimes. It can be a bit of a, a challenge and it is, you know, just, just the message really is uh, that it's okay not to be okay. And if you need to reach out, then, you know, the support's there and available. Yeah, that's it. And it, it doesn't matter who you are either. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're a footballer, you know, or a plumber or mm-hmm. whoever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it, it shouldn't matter either. Um, but the good thing is, is like you say, with the awareness but being out there a little bit more now, people have probably had access to help that they probably didn't realise existed before. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so we go back to this now as well um, in regards to, you know, a little bit more football-based and mm-hmm. um, other, other commitments-based and things like that. So what do you do now that you're no longer playing? Are you involved in, you know, uh, is it a, a business that you're running or...? No, so I uh, I'm currently a senior sales exec for um, for BMW. Right. Um, I've been with BMW now for for two and a half years. Yeah. And when I stopped playing, um, I started working for them. And um, obviously, football was always my first passion, but yeah. my second passion was always cars and always BMWs in particular. Um, yeah, yeah. I've been a customer of them numerous amount of times. So. Um, it was a it was quite a, a nice transition to go 
and work for a business that you that you already had a lot of knowledge and affiliation for you know so um yeah that's that's what i do now they're quite smart cars as well they're the bmws i'm sure uh is that what you is that what you're driving at the minute is it or yeah yeah i do yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. That's, that's good then um so uh, i'm sure you probably got company discount as well did you or <laughs> yeah, unfortunately you don't give any <laughs> <laughs> But no, um, have you been able to follow the club upon leaving at all? I know, you know, in, when your players leave clubs, it's it's not always that easy, and you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not not easy to follow up with uh, how their their previous clubs have been doing. But do you, you know, know much about what's happened, and you know, towards the yeah, end of I, the I game and the reprieve and things like that? Yeah, I still try and keep my my hand in with what what goes on. Like you say, it's a bit different when you're out of football and you have other commitments and yeah. you know, football is no longer the, the number one focus uh, where it would have been previously um but you know i'm still i'm still an active follower of of the scores and who's playing who's not playing and um even you know my ex teammates are still you know are, are looking out for them as well you know to see what they've been doing and of course, you know, we touched on it there just briefly as well in regards to the whole situation with the relegation and then the reprieve from Macclesfield yeah. and what's gone on and happened to them, of course, as well. Um, they've gone down the same sort of route as Bury, haven't they? And of course, Bury, a team that we played against and, you know, you scored against as well in that yeah. uh, game. Does, the final, yeah. The, the semi final through the playoffs. Yeah, it just shows, um, you know, Bury were. Were a high flying team, you know. Um, at, at the time, they had a, they had a very good squad. Obviously, that was why they were they were getting promoted themselves. Um, but it's so easy to to fall back, and you know, obviously, Stevenage has sort of done that. And it is quite sad to see, really, because the clubs worked so hard to get where it was. Yeah. And, you know, for whatever reason, for it to, to drop back down would have been, you know, a, a real, real heartbreaker. But luckily that they've been able to get that reprieve and, and be able to keep their status in, in League Two. It's just obviously now they've got to start looking, as we did back then, as to how you can get up the leagues, get, get away from the relegation zones. That's right. And then, uh, of course, it's a whole new squad as well. And um, to, to the back of last season, even Alex Ravel has replaced, you know, 90% of that squad. He's only kept two or three. Um, mm -hmm. And he's, he's kind of trimmed the, the squad down a lot as well because there was a, a lot of players on the books last season that just weren't even featuring at all. Yeah, well, I'm sure they've probably looked at it, you know, from a business sense and they thought, well, what's the point in paying you know these other lads that we don't need when we can put that money to good use and get instead of having maybe three or four lads that you don't want there on good yeah. money yeah get one really good lad in you know that you do want and um i'm sure that's probably how they've looked at it that's right and he's, he's uh not shy to to use the youth and to use players that you know uh just about coming up into the football league for the first time as well a lot of them haven't really had a lot of uh, football league experience, but they've had conference experience and, and even a little bit mm -hmm. below that. But the games that you know I've watched and, and that I've seen so far, um, they're they're more than capable of coming in and yeah, that they're they're putting in a shift every week. And you know the results might not be there just yet. They might have only won the one league game um, and got a couple of draws in there. But there is a, a, a process, and you can see what Alex is trying to get them doing. Yeah, and you know, I think Stevenage as a club is is one of the advocates for taking players out of non-league and giving them platform to be successful. You know, i.e. the team that, that I played in, a lot of yeah. them lads were playing conference football before, um, and myself included. Um, you know, because you can't write the conference off or even the leagues below because they are really hard leagues. Mm -hmm. You know they are really, really hard, and they and they sometimes don't have the creature comforts of the the, the league clubs. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I'm I'm all for you know finding the the gem players that probably don't cost you very much in the lower leagues and giving them the opportunity to go and prove what they can do because it's going to be 
hopefully a saleable asset on the club's side as well, maybe in the future. Yeah, definitely. And that could always, uh, you, you know, you don't know where that's going to go. Um, if that player moves on and, you know, exactly. you don't know how much money you might get that, you know, for that player when they, when they leave. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so we spoke about the fact you, uh, you're not involved at the game, so in the game at the moment. Um, what would you say to the fans at this current moment in time who, you know, aren't able to physically support the team from the ground? Um, you know, what would you say to them? You know, obviously everyone's urged, uh, everyone's eager to get back into to football and, and into these grounds as quickly as they can now. I think, I think when it does come back is appreciate really, and I'm sure people will now is appreciate what you have. You know, yeah. we probably all took it for granted and this obviously would have never, ever been on anybody's radar. But I think people that are, um, you know, supporting from home, you know, I think it's a great thing. Any way that you can you can watch a game or listen into a game, however however you do it, um, the club still needs you. You know, the the players still need you. They still need your your um, good vibes that you get, whether it's on social media or whether it's mm-hmm. uh, different outlets, even outlets like this. You know, it's um, it's all positive, and it will only help the club. And then and it, like so, hopefully it won't be too long until you're allowed back in the stadiums. Hopefully, yeah, because, you know, everyone's urging the government to, to rethink even at the moment with these petitions that are going around and things like that is what I was going to get onto. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, as much as everybody wants to be back at the at the games, I think ultimately you've got to be safe yeah. first. That mm. is paramount. Um a game of football is still a game of football, you know, but your health is a complete different aspect or, you know, you, your family's health is the utmost importance. You know, if you, if you don't go to a game this year, you know, there'll still be games next year that you'll be yeah. able to, you know, yeah, sure. it, it's not going anywhere, shall we say, mm-hmm. but, you know, you, your family's health, as we've seen that coronavirus you know, somebody gets it now, they might not be here next year. So you'd much rather them be safe for the sake of a game of football. Yeah, oh, 100%, especially, you know, if you've got um, sort of elderly relatives, elderly grandparents, things exactly. like that. Yeah. It's not worth it. It's not worth the risk. No. Um, so we've only got a couple more uh, to, to get through. Um, so we kind of touched on it, but how important is it for a club like Stevenage to, you know, to be a football league club and, um, you know, some of the things that Stevenage have got going on around the club as well, the um, academy and the, the sort of links with Burger King and the, the sort of sponsorship deals with them. How important is all of that type of stuff for Stevenage? And, and of course, obviously, you know, they've got a lot to compete with as well in terms of other clubs in the local area, you know, Watford, Arsenal, yeah. Chelsea, West Ham. Yeah, it's, fair. it's, it's hugely important. You know, the club has worked so hard to get, as I said to you earlier, to get where it is. Yeah. Um, you know, not just for revenue and things like that, but for, as you say, the being able to attract the best players. The best players want to pay in the highest leagues that they can. Yeah. You know, you're going to be able to attract more players in League Two than you would essentially in the conference. Um, but it, it's, it's massive. It's absolutely massive. The club deserves to be a league club you know it's got a great training ground great stadium you know fans that will follow them all over the place you know very loyal fan base um and i I think a fan base that's been there you know in the lower leagues and has now enjoyed you know being in league one you know potentially going to be into the championship that i think they've, they've been through the mill um so from a club's perspective, it's absolutely huge to remain a league, a league club, you know, and and I I do believe it at the moment it it should be a League One club. And it's like you know, if you look at Phil Wallace as well, um, the stuff that the club have done in the community, Phil has been recognised today. I think it was for mm. um, for the stuff he's done by the by the Queen on on the Queen's honours. He's got a um, I'm not quite sure what award it was he was yeah. given. British Empire Award or something. That's it, yeah, for uh, the work that he's done there. And, of course, that's that's crucial as well. You know, the 
the fact that obviously everyone was struggling and the vulnerable and elderly people had that kind of community support from the club as well. It says a lot, doesn't it? It says a lot about, you know, how the club is run, um, you know, from the top as well. I think it it just it perceives what I already know, I think anyway, of, of, of how uh, Phil can be. Yeah. Um, you know, as a club, it needs the local community, you know, because it's, it's not, obviously, as we know, it's not the biggest of clubs. And mm-hmm. it will, it, it does need that community support for the, for the club to, to thrive. Yeah. Um, and as you say, you're up against some of the, the Premier League clubs that are in and around um, yourselves or even, you know, like the likes of Luton, which is obviously a, a massive club as well. Um, so I can see why they, they focus heavily on the, on the community side of things because they're the they're the ones that are going to keep the club going in the future. That's right, and of course, you know, we we said it uh, just a little while ago as well in regards to um, the the completion of the stadium as well mm. with the new north stand. All that's completed now, um, and it's you know the the stadium just it, it just feels like it's it's completed, but it's yeah, it, it's kind of got to that stage that you know finally really because it should have been like that years ago. Um, yeah, but yeah. obviously the council had their own issues and that with it as well. Yeah, and again, that all comes down to funding. You know, mm-hmm. that, that wouldn't have been cheap to do that. So, um, you know, again, it, you got to take your hat off to the chairman and, and to the people behind the scenes that have been able to get that type of stuff in place because, again, that's only going to benefit the club in the long run, in the future. And, you know, the initiative with, with Burger King as well and... Uh, the Tifosi scheme, um, you know, lots of other initiatives as well, you know, even the academy as well, and the academy produ- just continuing to produce players for the first team. And it's a, it's a club that, you know, it might not have been great on the pitch last season, but it was still great off the pitch. It's still producing a lot. There you go. Well, I think you said it well there. You know, it, it might not always be what's happening on Saturday, but if you look at the overall picture of what type of club it is. Yeah. It's a lot better club than a, a lot that are in the the leagues at the moment, you know, and probably in a lot more of a stable position as well because of the way Phil has always run it than some of the other clubs, as you said, like the likes of Berry and, and you know them them clubs that go out of business. That's right, and you know the way that Phil runs the club, obviously that's um, you know he come out and he said it the other day that it's, it's been hit quite hard by. Uh, coronavirus, even on Sky Sports News, I think it was he come out and he said about that. But you know, with the the sort of parachute payments, I think it is from the the higher leagues as well, um, and and even just just the way that he runs the club as well. Is what I was going to say there. Um, the the club are uh, a club that you know not you know in any danger of going down that route, the the Bury route or the Macclesfield route, for example. No, ho- and hopefully it never will. But um, I'm sure Barry never seen it coming yeah. either. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, but I'm sure there's probably been decisions that have been made over the last, you know, few years that if they could go back and change them, then they they would. Um, but again, like I say I think I don't think Stevenage has that sort of issue. Touchwood, uh, and it wouldn't, because I think it's just been a well-run club, you know, from from the top down, really. Um, and then we've just got a final couple of questions, really. Uh, so, who were your main inspirations growing up, sort of both in the game and, and out of the game as well? Um, well, in the game, um, you know, I always I was a big Coventry City fan yeah. um, when I was younger, and and you know, I, I I used to live by their their old stadium at Highfield Road, so you know, I always used to go and watch their games, um, and I think. <sighs> There wasn't anyone in particular within it. It was just the love of wanting to do that job mm-hmm. um, when even from a, a young age. Um, I think my family have been obviously massively supportive. Uh, they've followed me up and down the country, you know, when I've been playing at, at some rubbish teams <laughs> and rubbish pitches. And to obviously the likes of playing at Old Trafford and White Hart Lane, you know, yeah. they, they've been there. They were there from start to finish. Um, you know, and I think most 
footballers will say the same, the, the biggest inspiration and the biggest factor in them being where they are is because of their family. Okay. Um, and then have you always played as a striker or, you know, when you were a youngster, did you sort of play elsewhere or were you a little, little bit more versatile? Uh, I started off as a goalkeeper. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, as soon as I, uh, soon as I got to about 11 or 12 years old, I'd become a centre forward and then that was it. From then on, I just had a knack of scoring goals. So, um, that was where that's where I've always always wanted to play. Okay, um, and then we spoke about the coaching and, and management stuff mm -hmm. earlier, um, and that was that's pretty much it, really, to be honest. So um, that's that's yeah, that's that's good enough, to be honest. Unless you've got anything you want to add in regards to no, your time at the club or just a, another message for the fans or anything like that. Um, otherwise, we can just leave it there. Well, it'd be nice to um, obviously when everything is back to normal. Um, you know, for me to to come back and watch a game, you know, and, and see the stadium now complete, you know, it'd be it'd be nice to come back and see a few old faces as well and uh, and actually see the the team up close. And like I say, I'm sure there'll be some fans there that I, that I'll recognise as well. Absolutely. Um and of course Phil's still there and you know there yeah. lots of lots of players there. Um that are you know well not not players as such but you know Ash for example um, I think Ronnie's still around the place he obviously plays for Billy Ricky now but I think he's still coaching at Stevenage as well so we still didn't still didn't manage to get rid of him just yet yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no thank you very much thank you for the interview it's good that's all right Craig thanks a lot and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, whatever else you've got going on hopefully uh, it's all right for your your missus as well. Um, in regards to, to everything on the, the, the COVID side. And uh, hopefully, yeah, uh, everything's, you you know, everything's all you. good. And, uh, we're, we're back in stadium soon and able to go and support our local club again. Yeah, hopefully. Well, thank right, you very cheers. much. See you soon. Cheers. Thanks, Craig. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye, mate.